And uh, I remember being sick, man, and in, in Yale New Haven Hospital one time, I'm, I'm about 12 years old, and I'm hearing my mother and a doctor outside of my hospital door. And a doctor in like this really matter of fact voice, he says, Mrs. Cohen, you shouldn't accept, you shouldn't expect your son Ty, Tyler, uh, Ty to grow up and live past the age of 17. So they didn't know that I heard this, right? I'm, I'm bawling. I mean, I'm 12 years old. I'm crying. I'm thinking it's like I got five more years to live. The myth, the legend, <laughs> Ty Cohen. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today, dear bro. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you asked me to be part of this interview series. I know you've got some great names that are being interviewed. And, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed is whenever you put something together, you put your heart and soul into it. You, yeah. your, your primary mission is to provide true value to people. So I'm honored to be a part of this. So thank no. you. No, oh, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. That's a, that's a great compliment coming from you, man. I, you know, I've been following you for, for some years. In fact, uh, I've, you've heard me say this before, but for those who are just watching, uh, Ty Cohen was one of the first uh, Black people that I saw in the internet space, right, that, that, that was doing something, right, uh, on a different platform. Uh, you know, there was you, I believe there was Stephen Pierce. You remember Willie yeah. Crawford? Willie mm -hmm. Crawford, yeah. Yeah, two, yeah. Two really good friends of mine, Stephen yeah. and I, we still work on a lot of things together. He's part of my uh, sales team, actually. And, and so that was it. So, yeah. what, so getting started in this space and seeing so many other people from different communities having success, but then to see them invite you on the platform with, with uh, you talking about the publishing business, the Kindle publishing business, which was really just taking off at that time. And we're going to really yeah. dive into that because you've built this phenomenal business. And I really want people to understand how to get into this space and, and, and how to get in contact with you to, to build their businesses in this Kindle space and online publishing. Um, but you were one of the first, man. So I've always enjoyed following you. And then just the interaction over the years that we've had. I mean, you're a deep thinker, always giving, always sharing. I mean, even before we hit the record button, I mean, you you, you know, you're, you're at, I don't know if you want to tell them where you are right now. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're actually at Myrtle Beach, man. But we, we started moving into, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that I talk about, and you kind of alluded to this, is creating digital real estate, right? So digital content, whether it's intellectual property in the form of ebooks or videos, or, uh, like what we're doing right now, audios, MP3s, podcasts. So all of this is considered digital real estate. So making money off of that and then putting that money into something more tangible, physical real estate, right? Or, um, funds, the stock market, um, cryptocurrency, which wouldn't be really too tangible, right. but just kind of diversifying, right? So, so my family and I, what we've been doing is we've been really heavily getting into the real estate game. And one of the properties that we just recently closed on is the one that I'm sitting in now, which is in Myrtle Beach, um, and it's just cool, man, to be able to see your kids uh, publish books like, like the one I'm holding here and see that that money comes in and then being able to show them the process of buying physical real estate with that. So, so what we do is my wife and I, we make it a point to, to bring them to our closing so that they see the attorneys, to bring them to, um, you know, uh, the, or to, to have been present when the inspectors are coming by, when the appraisers are coming by, so that, you know, at 13, at 16, this, is, this becomes a normal way of life for them, right. right? I got a shirt that I wear, I actually was going to wear it today, it says normalized black wealth, right? right? So that it doesn't seem like this anomaly whenever you, 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 you're doing certain levels of business. It's just like, hey, you know, we've been doing this all along. Right? right. We're not waiting until our 30s or our 40s or our 50s or our 60s so that this stuff becomes more normal. You know, you're saying your kids are doing it and it's part of the process. They know the walk. They know the talk. 
They're highly confident when they're dealing with professionals and people that are at other levels. They know that you don't have to have the three-piece suit on all the time. You can go in with your shorts and your jeans on, your sneakers on, and you're making these billion-dollar deals. So um, I know I went off on a little bit of a tangent there. I'm, I'm just excited, man. I'm ready to just go into this thing and, and talk to our people. So there we go. No, that no, that's beautiful, man. And because and you've already, because uh, I really want to unpack everything that you said, right? So you kind of, we, yeah. we start off, you kind of give us this this big picture. And as I mentioned, you've always been very sharing uh, with, with with the information. You know, we're, we're in a part of a mastermind together and you're always talking about the books you're reading, nuggets, um, and we're having these exchanges with, with other members in, in the group. So this, this is always uh, pleasurable to hear you talk about these things in this way. So you, you've given us this big picture, right? Uh, kind of understanding the, the lifestyle business that you have right now. I mean, even last year, I remember uh, when the pandemic first broke, uh, I remember you sharing. I mean, I think you and your family got into an RV <laughs> and just started <laughs> <laughs> while everybody else is shutting down. China got an RV no. and they're going across country, man. So you're the epitome. Right of the lifestyle entrepreneur, man. So this, I, I love this. And we want to unpack all of these things, but it wasn't always like this, right? So most people, no. yeah, you know, your very beginning, what was Ty Cohen like as a little boy? Man, it, you know, it was, it was interesting because you don't realize that you're poor until you see something that helps you to, to, <laughs> to contrast it, right? You, you just think, like, you, I don't think you even think about it, to be honest with you. So I, I grew up in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, Right. So Connecticut is maybe about 15 minutes from where I was at, 15, 20 minutes from the Bronx, from um, uh, maybe about a half hour from Manhattan, Harlem. Um, we used to take the train up there, drive up there a lot. And because we're so close, you also get a lot of element that wasn't conducive to the area. So this was in the 80s and, you know, like 90s when crack and heroin was rampant and it was very destructive to our communities destructive to a lot of communities. So we saw, I saw a lot of gang violence. I saw, you think of Connecticut, right? You're thinking cows and, and farmland <laughs> right. and pasture. And I had people who would even say black people live in Connecticut, right. you know, but at, at one point in time for several years, we had the highest murder rate in the country in, in Bridgeport and more specifically in the projects where I grew up at, it was called Father Panic Village. And if you go in and Google Father Panic Village, you'll see that they eventually tore it down because it got so bad that police would be afraid to come in. State troopers would be afraid to come in. Uh, I remember a state trooper getting killed in Father Panic Village. He actually got ran over, you know, he was trying to stop some guys and end up running them over and, in his own car, which is crazy. So you think about that type of stuff. Um, so, so that was me growing up and seeing all of this stuff that was going on, right? I also grew up with something called sickle cell anemia, which a lot of people who are watching this probably have heard of. So there's sickle cell anemia trait and then there's sickle cell anemia of a disease. Mm -hmm. So out of eight, eight of us, it was me and my older sister, Gwen, who grew up with it, who were born with it. And uh, she, she passed when she was 27. And uh, I remember being sick, man. And in, in Yale New Haven Hospital one time, I'm, I'm about 12 years old. And I'm hearing my mother and a doctor outside of my hospital door. And a doctor and like this really matter of fact voice, he says, Mrs. Cohen, you shouldn't, accept, you shouldn't expect your son, Ty, Ty, uh, Ty, to grow up and live past the age of 17. So they didn't know that I heard this, right? I'm, I'm bawling. I mean, I'm 12 years old. I'm crying. I'm thinking it's like I got five more years to live. Right. So um, long story short, man, I get out of the hospital and uh, I had been, I would be in and out of the hospital for weeks, you know, probably freaking dozens of times, hundreds of times in my life. And uh, about a year later, my, my older sister Gwen, she ended up dying from complications of sickle cell anemia. So reality really hit. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, man, I don't, I don't really have much time left. So mm -hmm. I ended up having a lot of fun, destructive fun. You know, mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of my friends go to jail. I'm seeing a lot of my friends, you know, get killed. And, and I'm thinking that my reality is that either sickle cell anemia is going to take me out like it did my sister or my environment is going to take me out. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it's done to a lot of my family members and friends. So I, I started to have, you know, a, a lot of, I just started to go in a, in a, in a really bad direction, wow. very bad direction. So, 
So that was me growing up. And going back to what I'm saying, where you don't realize that you're poor until you have something to compare it to. Right. So I ended up getting a job at Walgreens Pharmacy and becoming really good friends with who was my manager at the time. And he lived in the next town over, which was Fairfield, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Bridgeport, Connecticut and Fairfield, Connecticut, one town over a night and day, <laughs> night and day. Right. You've got a lot of affluence that's in Fairfield. You had uh, Westport. You had stars like Hulk Hogan and Diana Ross and people like that with these huge multi-million dollar mansions. And then you had us in the projects. Mm-hmm. So my boss ended up getting married one day and he invited me to the wedding. And then right before the wedding, we go to his house. And I'm looking at the house and I'm like, I've never seen anything like this. Now, mind you, it wasn't now in hindsight, as I'm older, it it wasn't anything spectacular. But it was amazing compared to where we were living. I'm like, people are living like this. It probably was like a a two bedroom or something at the (laughs) time. Right. But I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm 17 years old at this time. Right. And I'm like, are you serious? Like people are living like this. And at that moment, that was one of the pivotal points. That was one of the paradigm shifts that I had Mm. where I said, I know that there's more out there and I deserve to have more. I don't know how I'm going to get it. I knew that the illegal route was not the way because I saw what happened there. Um, And and, 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 and in a way, I knew that entrepreneurship was the way. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how I found that out, but I just... Because I didn't have any mentors, anything around me, right? That were entrepreneurs of the legal type. So, but I knew that entrepreneurship was the way. Because Mm -hmm. I was working at Walgreens for such a long period of time. I started when I was 14 through the summer job program. And now I'm 17, three years. And I didn't really see much of a difference economically for me. Right. You know what I mean? And and my, my, not a lot of change. And my dad was the hardest working guy that I knew. I mean, this dude worked mm. three jobs. He was a construction worker. That was his main job. He would get up at four o'clock in the morning. And then after that, he would drive taxi and he was a security guard. Right. So he was the hardest working guy that I knew. So mm. I knew that I couldn't work 20 hours a day. You know, he was working like 18 hours a day. And he ended up ultimately passing because, you know, as, as a taxi driver, he ended up getting robbed and somebody shot him a couple of times mm-hmm. and things like that. So I knew that that was a dangerous route as well. And, and so entrepreneurship became more and more clear to me. I just had to figure it out. I right. just had to figure it out. So, so that was it. So comparing, being able to, people always say that the numbers don't lie, right? So, mm-hmm. so poverty in a sense is a number. Right. Because you're limited to what you're able to get. But then when you see non-poverty, you even see like a middle class family, you are able to see that there's a difference in numbers there. Mm-hmm. You just have to figure out what is it that they know about those those numbers, what's in between this number and this number so that you can fill in the gap. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you stay focused enough to get to that point, even if you don't know anything about it, you know how you're going to get there. Once you set your eyes on that mission. Right. Heaven and earth will be moved to help you get there. Right. So you kind of just intuitively, you kind of intuitively knew that you had to kind of follow these, these really these paradigm shifts, right? You, you go to the house uh, of the manager and you see something different. And then you start seeing uh, the, 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 the lack of success, if that's the the appropriate way to put it, of those Mm -hmm. who are working hard but yet not yeah. achieving that level of success. So intuitively, you just knew that there was something else. Yeah, man, it's, it's like the rat race, right? You hear, you, you hear that term of someone being uh, on his hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was my dad. Mm-hmm. Fast, I mean, moving, 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 working, working, mm-hmm. working, working, working. And, um, and, and not seeing much progress. He still lived in the same area, right? I mean, mm-hmm. him and my mom were separated. He would still, he would come by and take care of the family, give us funds and things like that. But he still, he lived just a few blocks away from us. Right. right, right? So it wasn't like he was able to really elevate himself. It wasn't like he was able to have a better quality of life, much, right. much different from what everyone else in, in the neighborhood was having. So I, I knew that, listen, there's, there are people that are, extremely successful financially because success can be defined in so many different ways right. that are not doing 18 hours a day, right. that are not doing eight hours a day, that are not putting in four hours a day. They figured out ways of getting 
uh, their money to work for them. They figured out ways of being able to generate massive amounts of money. They figured out ways of generating passive recurring income, mm -hmm. right? And, and those are just things that we normally are not taught. We're not, right. we're not introduced to. So that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm so, you know, pressed when it comes to making sure that my kids see all of this stuff and it becomes normal to them, right? It becomes normal to them. Man, that's that's awesome. And there's, yeah. I, there's a lot that you said that we really want to unpack. But before we move on and unpack these things, I'm, I just want to make sure that hopefully you're writing down, taking some notes, those who are listening, you using terms like passive income, putting your money to work for you, creating assets, all of those things. We really want to unpack some of those things. But before we move to that, Ty, I really want to ask because now because you mentioned something, right? You you hear the doctor say, OK, don't yeah. expect him to live past 17. And now here you are 17 and you're mad. Right. Right. And, and, and you're still alive. What? So now what what where does this wheel come from now to keep going? Because most people would just shut down There's some say, OK, this is it. This is what the doctor said. What's kept you going? So now you're seeing these paradigm shifts and you're like, I don't care what the doctor said. I'm mm -hmm. getting ready to keep going and start creating and building wealth. What, what was happening at that moment at 17, 18 that kind of kept you going, even though you knew that news that came from the doctor? <laughs> Man, I just love life, nah. right? I was, <laughs> I, simple, I, was at, I was at a point where girls were starting to become very important, right? And I'm like, I cannot leave this earth. You see all of these beautiful women that are out here. <laughs> you know, and, and, and just being, so, so on a more serious note, right? So just not letting any one person define who you are. Mm. Right. Not letting any one person. I don't care if that person is the authority. In this case, it was the doctor. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Or if it's a family member, because sometimes family members will lovingly steer you in the wrong way right. by accident. Right. right? right. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some some examples of that. Um, I don't care if it's you, because sometimes, you, man, you're the person that you got to talk out of, out of, out of some mm -hmm. of this foolishness the, the most. Mm -hmm. Right. When it comes to listen, before we jump down this thing. I'm like, maybe I should cancel out. I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm going to make something up. Tell, let me tell them that, you know, listen, and, and I've done a ton of these, right? But, right? but but you inside is going to talk you out of so many right. things that will hold you from your greatness. And I'll tell you another thing. So. Remember, I tell you, my mom and my dad were separated, right? So my dad would always come by on Sundays, uh, especially and 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 uh, force me and my younger brother Mike to go to church with him. Mm -hmm. So I remember one day we're, we're driving back, we're coming back from church. He's in his Volkswagen Beetle, the old school round one, and he had a book. Man, he had a book by Les Brown in the back pocket of his car, mm. and I had never heard of Les Brown. Um, but I was a ferocious reader because being sick and in the hospital all the time, my mom would bring comic books and books. So I just got into this habit of just reading everything. So I, I'm, you know, we had a 20 minute drive back to the house. So I'm picking up this book and I'm just flipping through it. And I see a black man on the cover and in it, he's talking about, you know, regardless of the obstacle, if you can look up, you can get up. Right. Never let someone else's opinion of you become your reality. So I'm, I'm thinking he's talking to me. I'm like, talk, let's speak, let's talk. <laughs> right, right. You know, and I'm never, I'm never hearing, I, I've never heard personal development, self-improvement. I've never read it before. And here it is, this individual that looks like me, he's speaking all of these empowering words into me. Hmm. So I, I, um, I actually stole a book out of my dad's car. I don't know why I didn't ask him if I could have it because he would have told me, yes, absolutely. Right. But I ended up taking the book and, and uh, I stayed up the entire night man, reading that book. That was my first uh, piece of exposure to personal development. And that was another paradigm shift. So I don't, I don't think there's ever this one thing in life that happens. There's this series of continual things that will take place, right? And we just have to be, open enough. I was having this conversation with my son the other day, my, my, my 16 year old who just turned 17 and we're in a store and we're buying, um, we're buying, uh, we're buying juice and, um, he's an athlete, uh, Gatorade. And I wanted him to get the sugar free one. He's like, dad, I don't, I don't, I don't want to. I'm like, sometimes you have to open up your horizons. You have to, you know, be willing to expose yourself to other things because you never know what's out there. 
Mm-hmm. So had I looked at that book and not been willing to open it up and take a look at it, even though it was far different from the comic books that I was used to reading, mm-hmm. I may not even be here talking to you right now. Mm-hmm. I may not even be alive, mm-hmm. you know, because after I, I, I learned about Les Brown, I, I sought more, mm-hmm. right? I, I mm-hmm. sought more teachers. I, I wanted to, it just, it just kind of solidified the fact that there is more out there mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so i think just being open and, and willing to try different things yeah no this is good I, yeah no this is good man i really want to unpack that a little bit more because that was one of the things that i wanted to ask you because again observing you for, for some time and, and again just our, our brief interactions i know that you have this love for personal growth and development right i i know that by you know, always talking about the books the courses the training even recently you told me that you've invested in another program we were talking about from the book and you were showing yeah. all of the books so again we know that this is really some would say that the secret you know if there is if there is a yeah. secret right is it, getting into personal growth and development but i want you to unpack how you've been able to continue reinvesting in yourself through all of the books, all of the courses. And again, going from Les Brown through all of them. I, I mean, you've, uh, I don't want to mention all of the names that, that we've, you and I have discussed that you've, that you've uh, entered into their courses or their trainings, but it's safe to say right. that the variety is vast, right? So what fueled you or what is your fuel to keep you going and improving yourself on a continuous basis? And more importantly, your desire to give it back and encourage others to get into self-development. Man, so that's a great question. So Jim Rohn says, you know, um, he he says uh, traditional, and and I'm I'm probably going to screw up his words, right, a a bit. He says um, traditional learning, right, will get you by. Mm. But self-learning, right, meaning continuously learning outside of what we've been taught through traditional institutions can make Mm. you rich, Right. right? So, so just like hearing that sometimes just hearing little phrases and, 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 and kind of trying to prove them right. I think we got so conditioned to, to hearing things and wanting to prove people wrong. <laughs> right. But if you hear something like that, like, hey, traditional education, right, can get you by, but self-education can make you rich. Right. I heard that phrase and I want to prove him right. right. So let me go through self-education, especially nowadays, right? There's Anything that you want to learn is on YouTube or something like this, right? Where there's this interview series, you can go through and you can kind of listen through the trials and tribulations of other people that have gone through the same path that you want to go through. There's podcasts, there's magazines, there's books, everything you want. We recently went in and and put our family trust in place and and, and kind of put all of these elements into it. And um, as I'm dealing with one of the representatives uh, out there, a sister actually, who's who's uh, who, who's uh, a high-ranking sister with Bank of America Private, we're having a very candid conversation, and she says, you know, a lot of my clients they're they're older, mm-hmm. they don't look like us, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They are usually um, foreigners, and they have this high net worth. And she's like, I'm just curious, like, how did you learn about all of this stuff as it relates to trust and what to incorporate into it and having your trustees and your managers and all of these other elements and fail safe. And, you know, I'm like, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Real, no formal just, schooling, right? <laughs> right. No, no formal schooling, right? So, the, so everything, the answers are out there. You just have to want to have that desire for them. I think that the, 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 the thing is, is, you, there's this balance between overlearning because mm-hmm. you can also get paralyzed, right? By, by, by researching too much and making things perfect too much, but learning enough that it sets you on the right path. And then at that point you have to take action. So there's the learning element of it. There's the belief element, meaning that you too can do this if someone else has done it. Right. If Brother Bad- Bradford has done it, if Ty Cohen has done it, if whoever else has done it, right? right. Realizing, listen, that guy, t- Ty, you know, this guy is no smarter than me. He's, he, he's got that funny little list that he talks with, whatever. He's got that <laughs> accent, whatever. If that brother could do it, I know I could do it, right? right, right. And then put, putting in the work. So putting in the work. And the most important thing I would say also is being committed. So right. commitment and consistency. So meaning committed until burning my ships, right? Napoleon says, I'm going to burn the ships. But then, then being 
consistent in that commitment. Right. So I tell people that if you're trying to start a business, you should do something every single day on your business. Right. I don't care if it's not to, you know, negate or go against anyone's religions, but I don't care if it's a Sunday. I don't care if it's a holiday. I don't care if you're on the beach like we're on the beach here. I don't care if you're not feeling well. Listen, there's some times when I don't feel like doing it. Um, I don't care if there's, you know, of course, you're going to use common sense within this stuff, right? Sure. Um, you want to be healthy. But every single day, right, that's where that consistency comes into place. You should be doing something on your business. There's going to be times when you can put five hours into it. There's going to be days where you can put 10 hours into it. Then there's also going to be days where you could just put five minutes into it. Yeah. But building up that routine, that habit, right, that five minutes might be, let me just go out and revise my plan. Let me make a list of who I'm going to contact today. Let me go in and, 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 and look at the process for opening up a business license. Let me go in and look up a good CPA. But building up that habit and doing that consistently is going to really put you light years ahead of everyone else. Light years ahead of everyone else. Man, this is good. This is real good because I, I was just getting ready to ask you about your daily habits, right? And, and here it is, you, you, you talk about it. And so most people think that this is you know, some type of mysterious uh, uh, happening, right? Esoteric. Like, right. right. It, overnight, he's a success. But, and, and that's why I wanted to tell you, you to tell your story about where you come from. Because somebody right now is, is all obviously challenged with probably health. Maybe they've been given a bad diagnosis, or maybe they're challenged with something that's happening from the pandemic. And then they begin to feel, oh, woe is me. But here it is, you are even in the hospital at that time and heard this, but yet you've continued on uh, you've overcome that. Uh, I, I do know there was another paradigm shift for you that happened in your youth. Uh, you, you had a baby girl, right? So all of these things yes. begin to give your life meaning. And now you begin yeah. to develop these habits along the way. What other would you say that's contributed to your success? Um, you, you mentioned consistency, studying. Give me another mm -hmm. habit that you've incorporated, a daily habit that you've incorporated that someone needs to really pay attention to if they want to become successful as an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, man. And I'm going to be honest with you. This is something that you probably don't hear often and um, it could be looked at the wrong way, but really having this belief. So I walk around the house sometimes and my, my wife and kids, they, they hate hearing it sometimes. I'm like, I'm black Superman, baby. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so you, right. you got to kind of have this ego. That's now, right. I'm not saying it to be, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it to, to the point where you're putting people down, right? right. Or you, 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 the way to build up this, the biggest building in town is to, to kick everyone else down and now you've got the biggest building. But I'm saying to have this incredible belief in yourself, like yeah. this, and, and talk to yourself, yeah. like to really tell yourself the things that are possible for you, um, to, to really see it happening. Listen, you know what's very interesting? I'm not going to even use the word like crazy or wild or unbelievable because I think everything is possible. So the view that I'm looking, I'm looking out at the balcony right now and, and mind all of the crap that we got going on out here. But can you see the beach? Yeah, that's a beautiful. Okay. All right. So that, so I've got my vision board and not to start sounding all woo or anything with you, <laughs> but at home I have my my vision board in my office, and I had this picture, not this exact one, but one that is us overlooking the balcony onto the beach on my board for maybe about four or five years mm. or so. And I just so happened to look at it the other day, and I just had to give a little a small prayer of thanks. Right. You know. So. Those types of things, like just really believing that it's possible for you. And, and, and the other thing is not knowing how it's going to happen, mm, mm -hmm. right? Not knowing how it's going to happen. That's none of your business at all. None of your business how it's going to happen. Because if I told you so many things that I wanted to do and that I've ultimately done and that I've laid out the steps of how it's going to happen, and then I go back and I look at the steps and they are nowhere like the way I've laid them out. It's right. nowhere near how I've laid it out. Right. The only things that might be in order are that very first step, I'm going to get started. And mm -hmm. then the last step, this is where I want to end. Everything mm -hmm. else in between that, man, God, universe, whoever you want to you know, call it, has a, a, a totally different process. That's where the commitment comes into play. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you're going to have these, these, these moments where you say, okay, this is going to be step one, step two, step three. 
And if step two comes into place and it doesn't look like what you have down on your list, you could easily say, man, this doesn't work. Right. This is not for me. Right. You can easily give up. And I see so many talented people. I see so many smart people. I see so many people who, you know, I see VN for them, but they don't see VN for them. Mm-hmm who mm-hmm. give up just because the steps are not in alignment exactly in the way that they have it. So, so having that massive amount of belief in yourself when no one else has it, even when people have seen you succeed in areas, but they still don't believe it. Listen, I told my mom that I want to own 2000 uh, rental properties. Mm-hmm. This is a lady who has been my rock, you know, next to my wife who has been my biggest supporter who has uh, seen the growth that I've had from, you know, her having a little Tyrone. Now I'm putting my real name out there. I don't go, <laughs> don't go messing with me. <laughs> I, I don't want to hear the call Tyrone. Right, call Tyrone. You know, who's right. seen her, right, her baby boy Tyrone to the point where I'm at now. And I said, man, I want to own 2,000 properties. And this was just a couple of years ago. And the answer was like, boom, totally deflated everything. Mm-hmm. This mm-hmm. is my mother. Right, right. You know, and had me second guess it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I got back in the car, like, well, maybe I am dreaming too big. Right. And then I had to smack myself out of it. Right. You know, because just because someone else doesn't believe, that doesn't mean that you have to stop believing. That's right. So, so one of those biggest elements, man, are are the belief. And I'm talking about this in, in, in depth a little bit because it's super, super, super important. It's going sometimes when you talk about yourself in a good way. It is going to throw people off right. unless you have very strong, supportive people around you. It is going to throw people that are closest around you off. When you tell people your big dreams and goals, which you should, right. it is, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big believer of hiding those. It is going to throw people off. That doesn't mean anything um, bad about them. doesn't mean that they're not good people. It's just that their dream is not your dream or your dream is not their dream. And it shouldn't be. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's so, awesome. That's awesome, right there. Yeah. Just, just on that point, right there, because you you made me think about. I had a conversation with Kathy Hughes, uh, and that mm. was something that she said. She said she literally had to start lying to her mother because her mother would wow. say, "You know, come on, baby, why don't you get a good government job?" Because at that time, Kathy Hughes was sleeping on the floor in her radio mm. station. Right? We know her today as Radio One TV One, but she was li- the very first day she was sleeping on the floor with her son and cooking on a hot plate. And so when her With mother, her would, son. yeah, and so when mother would ask her, you know, baby, how are things going? She literally had to start lying to him. I said, Mom, things are going great, even though things weren't, because she knew that her mother would try to mm-hmm. convince her to give up her dreams. So that, so when you said that, that's the first thing that popped into my mind. That, and you said that earlier. I think yeah. you alluded to it earlier that the people closest to us sometimes out of mm-hmm. love, right? It's not that they mean- Out of love. Yeah, they, they're not yep. trying to hurt us. They're not trying mm-hmm. to damage the ego, but out of their love and trying to protect us, they can end yep. up talking us out of tremendous opportunity and dreams. That's good stuff, Ty. Now, listen, so so you you you, you, you can do that as well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So so the, the mind is a protective mechanism. Mm-hmm. It wants to keep us safe. It wants to keep us unharmed. So sometimes you'll have these goals and your mind will say, listen, nah, maybe you're dreaming a little bit too hard. <laughs> what will happen if you try and you fail and now everyone's saying, well, man, you used to drive a fence, now you're driving a bucket, mm. you know, or, you know, you, you said that you were going to do all of this and you haven't made any movement so far. Mm-hmm. So now we start to get all of these false scenarios playing in our head like a real live movie and they become so live that if we're not, I have to walk around and chuckle every once in a while because I, I'm like, okay, I see what's going on, mind. You're trying to fool me, I, <laughs> man. You you're good today, boy, right. but I got right. you. You know, so so sometimes you have to be crazy enough to believe things that other people would think that you were crazy for believing it. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you got to be crazy enough to believe that you can do things that if you told other people, they would think that you're crazy for believing that. They would think that you were nuts for believing it. Right. So, the, the, the uh, listen, it, it's not, I don't want to get up here and tell people that it's just work, 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 because there's so much other stuff. The intern, when I always, when, whenever I think about my journey, it, it has been work, mm-hmm. a lot of work. Uh, I'm not going to tell people that it hasn't been work, because I, I, I don't like when, when people say that as well, you can do it and it's going to be super easy. 
but the but belief, man, and the work go hand in hand. You cannot right. just have one without the other. Because my dad was that hard worker. Right. Right. And right. then I see people that, that believe they got their vision boards, they're doing mantras, they're meditating all day long, but they, they're missing the work element. Right. So they right. go hand in hand. So right. you have to have both. All right. So that's what is that? Be- belief counts for nothing except that it's carried into practice, right? So you got to have both <laughs> belief and practice makes it happen. Man, you bring up a, a, a ton of great points. And I know we're not going to be able to cover everything, but I, you, you mentioned something about um, like if something doesn't work out, because as you just alluded to, we don't want to give the appearance that the Tycoon would, you know, just a straight rocket ship, straight up. Everything has been straight up all of this time. So after you decided to go into entrepreneurship for yourself, uh, leaving your, your comfortable co- corporate job, um, I'm sure every, you had some setbacks. So how did you first, what was the first business that you got into? Uh, because you weren't always publishing yeah. on Kindle. What was the first business? And then when those things didn't go right, and as you mentioned, you have those friends that say, hey, man, I thought you were going to be driving this or right. living here, you know, <laughs> but it didn't happen. How did you rebound after those setbacks early in your career? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, so one of the first businesses I had was a, remember I told you I was heavily into comic books. So then I started collecting action figures like the Batmans and Supermans. And I'm in my early 20s at this point. So um, I started selling action figures, the mm-hmm. old G.I. Joes, right? The Disney windups and things like that. Um, I would go to, 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 to conventions and I would buy collections and resell them, me and my younger brother, Mike. And um, it was just fun, man, because here we are with two young black kids and all of our clients were older, middle aged white uh, professionals mm-hmm. that were attorneys and doctors right. and they're buying the stuff from us. And it was just it was just it would just tickle me to death to see this happening. And um, but that didn't last long. Now, when I had that business, it was doing really great. I kind of got distracted. I mean, I, I used to have some really cool cars. I was always known for the guy to have nice cars around the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And then I remember it not going well. And I had this old beat up Buick Regal. Mm-hmm. And I remember meeting a girl that I used to date. She knew me from before when I had all the cards and the look on her face to see me in this Regal. Like, she what, was ha- like, what happened to you? <laughs> 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 Jay-Z has that line. Right? He was the man, homie, what happened to you? And that's how I felt. Like before Jay wrote the line, I was like, I thought Jay was talking to me. <laughs> but so, so, that was one of those motivators to get back on to, and you're going to have the ups and downs. You're going to have the successes and, and true success comes to those that can stand the rain, right. That can stand the pain. Um, you know, one of the analogies that I like to use is that it doesn't rain all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might have, my mom died last, last November, last year, mm-hmm. right. Tough. Mm-hmm. It was a tough thing to get over. But that was also one of the biggest growth periods for me as well, mm, mm-hmm. right? So because that because that was such a painful period, it also brought the sense of reality to me that man, life is short. Like right. we have to like really have, have fun with this thing. We got to treat people well. We got to give as much as we possibly can, and we also have to really push our potential, right? Because we don't want to get to this point. Right again, we get to the end of our life and this person that we could have been is mm-hmm. presented to us at the end of our life. And we haven't lived anywhere near that, 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 that potential. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So hitting that as much as possible. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question no, that, or, that's, or not there. No, that's, but, that's uh, great. No, that's, that's a great answer, man. Because you, again, you, there's so many nuggets here. I mean, it, the, the conversation is pregnant, right? I mean, you, we say one thing and it can literally give birth to so many different right. conversations here. Uh, and, and this is good. So I'm hoping that, again, you're taking notes, just a quick recap, the, the consistency. Um, I love the part that you talked about uh, that talking to yourself, right? Uh, you know, the, mm-hmm. the self-talk. Right. Make it really becoming aware of who you are and building your confidence, because a lot of what we do in entrepreneurship and business, so much of it is confidence. If you don't have the confidence to move forward, um, anything can shatter your dreams or, or, or whatever your ambitions are. So, I mean, you've literally laid the base for a lot of things. I do want to ask you this question, because one of the things that you said, and then I want to get into your current business. And, and I know you've had yeah. some some some. Uh, adventures in between the first business with the comic books. I'm, I'm aware of some of those things and where you are now, but yeah. so that all this means is that we're going to have to do another one, right? So we're going to have to come back. So we're going to unpack some of those other things, but you mentioned something 
about being on the journey, um, mm -hmm. having this on your vision board and then saying that you wanted to do something, uh, but not knowing exactly how to do ah. it. Right? And, and, yeah. and I know recently we were talking uh, about a book, having some exchanges uh, about a book that I think all of us have started studying called Who, Not How. Right. And so right. a lot of times when we want to do something, you know, immediately our mind defaults to, OK, how do I do this thing instead of mm. who can I get to help me or show me or give me the shortcut? So I want you to speak to that, how effective that's been in your life by discovering the, the who that could help yeah. Ty yeah. build his business instead of Ty doing and having to learn all of the how to's. Yeah, I, I, that's a great question, man. I, I think that one of the most important things as entrepreneurs is to realize that we, although we feel like we should be doing everything, we should be the jack of all trades, we should be wearing every single hat, we shouldn't, right? right? We're not as good at everything as we think we are. Right. We're fooling ourselves. I, I've made that mistake for many, many, many years. Um, I think that the other thing is if you don't start leveraging the assets that are around you. And when I say around you, I mean planet wide, because right now with the digital age, we have no limitations. Right, right. All right. So everyone is planet wide. So you can literally hire people to do anything that you need them for, whether it's an accountant, whether you need someone to help you put together a business plan, which I think are kind of bogus. That's another episode. Um, <laughs> whether you're looking to have someone help you to scout out talent scout out locations you can hire people and there's sites where you can go in and do that mm -hmm. um and maybe it'll give you a couple of sites the biggest thing for me was realizing that number one i don't have to be this highly successful entrepreneur before i start hiring people mm -hmm. because if you're watching this right now you may just be starting or your business might be at the point where you're just making maybe five hundred dollars a month four thousand dollars a month right you or you might be in a deficit a little bit you can literally go in and hire people part-time or on the per job basis. That was the biggest eye opener for me. That was one of the biggest things that helped to really grow my business. Mm -hmm. Like realizing that I don't have to have this huge budget to hire people. I can hire someone for six bucks an hour for just three or four hours a week. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what 18, $24 mm -hmm. right. right here. Mm -hmm. Right. So even the Cohen part of my name here can really benefit off. <laughs> and I'm not going to go. Uh, hopefully you caught that one. <laughs> oh, I, most definitely I caught that. I was going to ask you about that one day. We'll talk about that one in another episode. <laughs> right. So, 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 so that was the biggest eye opener for me. Right. right? Because it allowed me, you, as an entrepreneur, listen, always think of freeing up your time. Right. Think of freeing up your time so that you can work on the things that are going to bring you the most amount of money and that you enjoy doing. So you should not be working on $5 an hour projects if you can use that same hours of the time to make $50 or $500 mm -hmm. or $50,000. Mm -hmm. Like when I got that concept, it totally exploded my business. Mm -hmm. So some of the websites that you can use to go in and hire people, and I want you to play around with this, guys, if you're watching this, is Upwork, U-P-W-O-R-K.com. That's one. Mm -hmm. Again, you can hire people to do anything. Uh, the other is Guru, G-U-R-U.com. Again, you can hire people to do anything, virtual people from across the planet. In the U.S., outside of the U.S., if you're looking for someone local, you can use Indeed, I-N-D-E-E-D.com. All right, I use all three of these sites in my business. I get people whether I need them for a one-off project or whether it's someone that I'm looking to build on, bring on the team and, and have with me forever or as long as possible. So... The, the biggest way to get over, because the, the mental hurdle is I'm not big enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't make enough money to go in and hire people. Or I don't know how to hire people. Right. Go on one of these sites, test yourself, hire someone for a three hour project, pay them 50, 40 bucks, 60 bucks, whatever it is. Uh, and, and then that's going to help you to get out of that limiting mindset. And then it'll, it'll just become fun after that. And if you need help, reach out to me and I'll definitely help you out. Yeah, this is great. Let's, let's, let's dive into that, man. The, the business that you're in, because the whole world has, has shifted, right? We're, we're uh, the yep. pivot of everyone coming into this virtual space. Again, I, I've been following you and I got into this space literally over 15 years ago. I mean, you know, before the YouTubes and the Facebooks and all of right. that, it was just information marketing then, right? We uh, cassettes and VHS tapes and all of that type of stuff. But then you're bringing again, them back. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you were one of the <laughs> first people, right? So here it is, right. my eBooks, when I first started, and of course, when you first started as well, when we were talking about eBooks then, it was just a PDF document <laughs> that you uploaded right. to a server. It wasn't Amazon Kindle or the Nook or some of the other iterations that it started at that time. So I want you to talk about now you how obviously we can't go through the full story of how you got into this space, but the current business yeah. you have now in this Kindle publishing, how did that start? What intrigued you about the eBooks and, and really the growth that you've had in this industry in helping so many people from around the world develop their own Kindle publishing empires. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So the way I got started in a nutshell was one of my other businesses was I thought I could start a record label because everyone around me in the hood was a rapper or a singer, right? So I said, I got or, all Or concert talent. promoter, or concert promoter. Or, or concert promoter, <laughs> right. there you go. But man, I, I felt at that miserably. Had a lot of fun, but felt at it miserably. Me too. <laughs> and it, so, so we got some war stories. Yeah. So, 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 so one of the things I realized that, man, there's so many other people that are trying to start labels, but they don't know where to start because I didn't know where to start. So mm -hmm. I took that education that I had and I, I turned it into printed physical books. At the time, Amazon had this program called um, Amazon Advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think it's still around if you go to Amazon.com for slash Advantage, where you can actually take physical books like this and ship, you know, two dozen, three dozen of, of them over to Amazon and they would handle the fulfillment, the orders, refunds, everything else. So I was doing pretty well with that. I actually, so here's the thing, guys because when I was selling my books locally, just in my city and my state, it didn't do well at all for me. Mm -hmm. But when I put them on Amazon and I now have this global platform, it started to explode. I started to sell literally thousands of books a month, thousands of books a month, where locally I wasn't able to sell more than 20 or so a month. Mm -hmm. um, so the key there is always think global, always think global with your business, if you, especially if you like money. So, 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 at that time, Amazon also was coming out with this new program called KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, where um, entrepreneurs like you and myself who had ebooks in this PDF format were allowed to come in and publish those ebooks in a more clean format on Amazon. And I thought it was the dumbest idea ever. <laughs> you know, they invited me to become this beta tester, and I'm like, ah, I'll do it. And I reluctantly took you know some of the Microsoft Word document files that I had for my printed books, and I loaded them up there, and I kind of forgot. To be honest with you, after I loaded them up there, I forgot. And I go back maybe about six weeks later and I had a, I forget what the amount was, but it was a significant amount of money mm. that was in my account. Um, it was like a couple of thousand or so. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> like, I don't have to ship out books. I don't have to get the refunds and everything else. And like, you're buying digital content. Now, mind you, as uh, marketers online, we had been used to the concept, as you alluded to earlier, of people buying ebooks. But here, Amazon was doing all the work. I uploaded my ebook one time and they were, right. they were selling. So I got hooked, man. That was it. So I ended up um, really publishing a ton of books, getting to the point where, you know, my account was making like 30000 a month and just continued growing and growing and growing. And then I had a couple of friends of mine, Stephen Pierce, who you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, dude, man, you got this system that is really working. You, you really owe it to the universe to teach other people how to do it. I'm like, all right, Stephen, I'm going to do it. Six months goes by. Come on, man, Ty, you're playing around. You're not sharing this stuff with anybody else. A year goes by, and Greg Caesar, you're in Atlanta, right? So do you know Greg Caesar? Yeah, I know Greg Caesar, but you do? Uh, dude, I met him at Ron's place once, yes. Okay, so Greg is my boy, best friend. Okay. And Greg was him and him and Steven and Jim Edwards, another marketer. Right. They're all trying to. I'm like, all right, man. I was comfortable with being behind the scenes. So eventually, I put together the course Kindle Cash Flow, and you know, it's it's grown. That was 15 years ago, 14 years ago. Right. And since then, I've introduced the system to millions of people. We've had hundreds of thousands of students, tens of thousands of successful students. Where you know, I come in and I teach them how to publish digital content. It's that digital real estate that we talked about at the at the very beginning of this, right? That helps them to create passive recurring streams of income. It's it's digital real estate that is intellectual property. If you think about it, listen, if you look at the wealthiest people on the planet, most of them are wealthy because of uh, traditional real estate, 
mm-hmm. or IP, intellectual property, mm-hmm. right? So that became the next step of my journey is I need some of this real estate. And I, and I don't care if it's, inf- if it's digital real estate or if it's physical real estate, but I need to be in the real estate game. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> and I also need to teach as many people as possible how to get into this, this real estate game as well. One of my missions is to create 1,000 black millionaires and hopefully on this, you help me to do that as well. Mm-hmm. So I created this three-step process that helps anyone who wants to be able to go in and create digital content and publish it on Amazon to create this passive recurring income. And the first step is to um, understand your market, right? So do market research so that you know who's actually buying, who's going to be your audience, and if they're spenders. Mm-hmm. Because we don't want to go through the work and we don't want to put this content together if it's not going to sell and if it's, if it's not going to massively sell. Like, we like money. Right. But I remember Dame Dash saying one time that he's greedy. He'll take the, 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 the dollar, he'll take the euro, he'll take the pound, he'll take the franc. Right. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, Dame, I want, I want, so, so when you're doing your market research, you want to make sure that you are going after markets that are massive, global. You're going after markets that are evergreen, right? So you're not publishing something that's going to be seasonal. And then you're going after markets that actually have money to spend, right? So if you go after like uh, three-year-olds or four-year-olds, then they don't have money. They have to go through the gatekeepers, which are the mm-hmm. parents. So that's the first thing I teach is how to properly do market research so that whatever you publish sells extremely well. The third, the second step that I teach is how to get the content actually created, all right? Because that was an obstacle for me. I'm not a writer. Mm-hmm. I felt mm-hmm. English one one not once, man, but <laughs> twice because I was an overachiever, right? right? So- Going back to what we talked about, leveraging other people's time, talents, and skill. So I said, okay, well, how can I hire people to write the content for me? So that's the second step is getting your content created. And that is whether you're writing it yourself or you're going to outsource it. So I've created this system that allows people to go in and outsource high quality content for less than 200 bucks. Now, mind you, $200 for content that's going to make you money day in and day out, right? Um, And then the third step is, How do you properly publish it to Amazon and market it? Because one of the issues that I found was, you know, a lot of people would go in and publish their content on Amazon and they'd make their book available, but then they don't get sales or they get a handful of sales, right? And we're after a ton of sales. So I created this streamlined process of really allowing your book to get uh, visibility, which then turns into sales and not just one-off sales, but repeat sales because it's easier to sell someone who's comfortable with you, who knows you, who likes you, who trusts you to come back and buy again. And we want those people to come back and buy multiple times. So they, we want them to buy like almost every ebook that we publish. And it's very possible using the process that I've created. Man, this, this is this is phenomenal. So two things that I want to say that I hope everybody picked up on. I mean, one, um, you, you don't have to be a writer. Right? You, you don't have to right. write. Thank God. So again, so most people probably said, I don't know how to write books. I, I never written a book. Here it is. Ty just told you, you don't even have to be a writer and he can he can show you how to get that process outsourced um, to where you could pay once and own this property that now pays you over and over again. And then the next thing, and I'll just ask you this time, we're not talking about gone with the wind or war and peace, right? We're, we're not talking about yeah. these big novels. What size books are we talking about here? Many things are 35 to 50 pages. Right. So 35 to 50 pages. Yep. And what we're doing is we're creating series. And again, you can do this in, with fiction or nonfiction, right? So you're creating a series and there's, there's this process to it. So we have this very well-worked system. Does that even make sense? Well-worked system? Well, we've got this very <laughs> well-worked well system. And I say well-worked because we've tested it on, on, on literally, like I said, tens of thousands of people across yeah. the planet, man, people yeah. of our ages, people of our backgrounds. And, and it's like the old paint by number system where it, you remember where it would say everything that is labeled number one, painted blue, number two, painted red, number three, painted green. Right. And then if right. you follow those instructions, you came out with a, a, right. a really cool looking picture. Right. Um, so 
that's it's it's a paint by number system. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's it's refined. I mean that's that's something that I hope that that, yeah. that the people are picking up on is that this is a system that you initiated over a decade ago, right? 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. But then over time you've kept refining it and perfecting it to now where it's, it's literally you just hand this system and and, and in the, hand the system over to individuals and they're able to generate the type of passive income. Really yearly income goals become monthly. <laughs> uh, income yes. goes. Yes. So th this is powerful stuff. So how do they reach out to you, Ty? How do they take advantage of the opportunity to work with you? So a couple of things. So what I want to do is I want to give you, your viewers, your listeners, a free copy of my new book. This is um, my new book, Kindle Publishing Secrets, Volume One. It has not hit the market yet. I don't know if you guys can see this. So if you're going to get an advanced copy of it, you know what's so cool about this? Remember I told you that Les Brown, you see how things come back around full circle. So Les Brown was one of my first mentors. He didn't realize it, right? He was a mentor because I'm reading his books, watching his videos. Right. He wrote the forward for this book. Awesome. So I got Les Brown to write the forward for this book. Series. So um, you'll get a copy of that if you go to kindlecashflow.com um, forward slash, let's put masters. So kindlecashflow.com forward slash masters, M-A-S-T-E-R-S. You'll get a free copy of it. And then I also have a video. So I've got an entire step-by-step -step video. It's about a two hour long video. So make sure you got some time because as you guys can tell, I'm a talker. Right. But I also, right. he's, he's like, yeah, you are talking. <laughs> no, no I this is good, so, man. It's good stuff. <laughs> so in this video, I walk you through the steps. So step one, step two, step three, and I give you the visual so you know exactly what to do. You're following along on my screen. So kindlecashflow.com forward slash masters at that will get you a free copy of a book and you'll get a chance to watch the video. First, thank you. Thank you for that, that generous, more than generous offer uh, so that everyone who comes in contact with this, make sure that you go to kindlecashflow.com forward slash masters. You're going to get a copy of Ty's book as well as a training. That's really what a two hour training is really going to walk yeah. you through this thing so that now you can uh, literally people, take the training and go and start making money <laughs> right from the training. So yep. we encourage you to, to take you up on that offer. So again, Todd, I could talk to you all day to be, to be honest with you. I mean, there's just so much, I mean, I got, Likewise. A page, I got a page full of questions and things that I could ask <laughs> you, um, but we don't have time. So we know we're going to have to do this again, but I really appreciate you taking time out of your, your schedule, uh, really just relaxing there on the beach, you know, right. Uh, but, but still working. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Last question, before we get ready to sign off, um, any parting words of advice? I really want you to kind of zone in on two people, right? Uh, the the budding mm -hmm. entrepreneur. What would, what advice would you give the person who this pandemic has probably, you know, disrupted their entire life, or maybe they're unemployed? So that person who's thinking about getting into the into business, they're a budding entrepreneur. So I want you to give them a piece of advice, and then those who yep. are stuck, right? Who are thinking about mm -hmm. what's the next step. Uh, do I need to reinvent myself or what can I add to my repertoire to make me a better entrepreneur and business owner? So I kind of want you to close us out with two yeah. pieces of advice to two, two different types of people. Yeah. So for, for the person that's looking to start, right, maybe get into entrepreneurship, the, the best thing that I can give you advice wise is to not overcomplicate the process. And what I mean by that is, especially if you're getting involved in some type of an online business, everything is editable. Everything you can go in and you can revise. It doesn't matter what it is that you're doing. You're going to make mistakes. Do not try. I see a lot of people who get in and they try to make it 100% perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Go in, make the mistakes, start fast, and then you can revise, right? Your marketplace will let you know. Trust me, they'll let you know where you're making mistakes at. And you just listen to them and, and go in. I've made tons of mistakes and I'm still making mistakes probably made a couple today um <laughs> but but go in move fast and and don't remember this do not overcomplicate the process simplify it as much as possible to the point where an eight-year-old can understand it because if an eight-year-old can understand it everyone can understand it and you'll get more people you'll get more people the, the simpler that you can make it the more people you'll get it that's awesome so so for the other individual, the other individual would be someone that might be stuck right now. You know, they've been impacted, right? They're wondering what's next. I would say, and this is something that I've had to do too in one of my businesses, one aspect of my businesses, 
is to pivot, to learn how to pivot and to, again, jump in really quickly, right? To not overcomplicate the process, but to pivot. So here's how we had to pivot. So we, were, we had 20 events lined up in 2020. So 20 live events, right? Um, Kindle Castle live events. We, we did one, we did three. So January, February, March. So we did one in Maryland in January, February, we did one in Tennessee. And our last one was in March, we did in Las Vegas. And then the world shut down. Now we had 20 planned from Canada, all across the US, et cetera. And we're like, well, now what? Like, what do we do next, right? People had tickets, people you know, were expecting to come. We had to pivot. We had to pivot into doing virtual events. So events like, like this, right? And those ended up being some of our better events. We have a virtual event that's coming up in April, actually. If you're interested in that, you can go to KindleCashflowLive.com. And the virtual events actually end up being a lot easier, a lot more profitable, and we're able to serve more people because now there's not the limitation of uh, travel, hotels, uh, higher expenses. So being able to pivot now, I had no clue as to what I was doing when it came to the virtual events. But again, YouTube and using your network, right? And, and, and reaching out to people, it becomes a lot easier. So jumping in, right? Pivoting, looking at where the world is going and trying to position yourself so that you can be there once the crowd gets there. Wayne Gretzky, uh, the great hockey player, they asked him, listen, how are you, why are you so good at, at hockey? And he said, yeah, I'm just good at pretty much anticipating where the puck is going to be and then making sure that I'm there before it gets there. So that's what you want to do in business. That's it. Man, this is awesome, man. Again, Ty Cohen, everyone, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you so much, brother. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you all go to kindlecashflow.com forward slash masters to get the book and the, uh, the actual training, almost a two hour training that Ty is offering to you for free. Again, this is all free. Yeah. And then, of course, if you want to know about the live events, go to KindleCashflowLive.com. And then now you need to join Ty Live and, and, and become one of these uh, dynamic publishers and own some digital real estate like Ty Cohen. So, again, thank you so much, dear brother. I really appreciate you. Hey, do you mind if I give you uh, – I want to give your listeners my number, too. So I just got this number here. If you ever have any questions on any of this stuff, I want you to send me a text, all right? My cell phone number is area code 203-526-6031, all right? Don't give me a call because if I see a, a number that I don't recognize, I probably won't answer it, but send me a text, 203-526-6031. Let me know that you saw this on the Masters of Business. Any question that you have about business, about Kindle Publishing, about uh, childhood I've got, uh, <laughs> or raising kids. I got four of them. <laughs> everything. No, everything. You, you, anything. you, you are, yeah, you're a wealth right. of knowledge. And again, just, we hadn't even scratched the surface on all of the things that you got your hands. We talked about real estate, developing uh, trust and we, all of this type of stuff is something that, that Ty has been very giving to so many. So again, I would take him up on that offer. Uh, so uh, how many people do you know, give out a text number, say, send your questions in, give you free books, give you free training. So again, Ty, you're more than generous as always. Thank you so much, dear brother. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Talk soon.